peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any. Even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Hello, brothers and sisters of Christ. There's one mirror between Christ and man, the man, I'm sorry, there's one mirror between man and God. There's one mirror between man and God, the man Christ Jesus. There's one name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. It's Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. So what I'm going to do real quick is I want to start out with singing a hymn. And we're going to sing a hymn, In Christ Alone. Okay. If you want to pause and look up the words, you can pause and look up the words. But In Christ Alone. In Christ Alone. My hope is found, He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, Firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, When fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness. Scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, The wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I stand. There in the ground his body lay, Light of the world by darkness slain, Then bursting forth in glorious day, Up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, Sin's curse has lost, its grip on me, for I am his, and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man could ever pluck me from thy hand till he returns and calls me home. Here in the power of Christ 
I stand in Christ alone. So, Brother Scott, I'm sorry, it kind of gets a little high for me in some of those parts, but uh, in Christ alone, the reason I sung this song is to encourage. We got a, a big prayer request from a brother and sister in Christ in Belgium. And they wrote me a little letter from Belgium saying, Hello, brother, is everything all right with you over there? So far, things okay, brother, sister in Christ. Thank you for asking. Staying in the Word, staying in prayer, trying to put together Bible studies. Uh, doing a lot of expository studies with a lot of brethren uh, on uh, video Skyping and, and fellowship and Bible studies face-to-face -face with some of the brethren. God has opened doors, praise the Lord. Um, but this brother and sister in Christ in Belgium, he says, Here everything is more or less fine. We would like to ask you that you will pray for us in these very difficult times of rebellion by, very, by various people in our neighborhood and beyond. As a family, we are facing a lot of opposition because we will soon be preaching the gospel of our Lord again in different villages. Now remember, this is the Brother Sister Christ that are doing it. There are Brother Sister Christ over in Belgium doing a ministry. They request a lot of Bibles, and they go out and they preach the gospel, and they give Bibles to people who want King James Bibles, which is hard to get over there. King James Bibles, and um, leading people to Christ and giving them King James Bibles. And their country is predominantly Catholic. Okay, we're going to get into this. but In different villages, people and even neighbors who know about this and who are mainly Catholic send threats now on paper in our mailbox and have even damaged our car with scratches, which we, have, which we are sure are neighbors. My wife has seen it. They send letters that we no longer fit in with their community as Christians... You know, now don't get me wrong, there's, there's the Bible definition of Christian in Christ, and then there's the lost world who likes to steal that, that title Christian, and they use it for all kinds of false religions and Bible versions, but you have uh, Roman Catholicism and her daughters love to steal that word and use it for themselves. So they say, you no longer fit in with our version of Christianity, is what they're saying. Praise God. Real quick, I want to stop there with this brother and sister Christ and all the brethren. Praise God that we don't, you know, we don't uh, fit in with the world's Christianity. That's why the Lord put it on my heart to name this channel uh, King James Bible Believing God Fearing Ministries. Okay, we like to do things God's way, and this is our foundation, not the world's way, and we don't fit in with the organized, professing Christian world. So we no longer fit in with their community as Christians and that we should move. They're trying to run them out. My wife is very sad every day about these events and we pray every day to our Lord that this may stop. Now remember what, we're going to get into a little bit more exhortation with the scriptures but how Paul talked about he glories in his infirmities. Amen. And someday we're going to get to go home. You're not going to have to put up with it forever, Brother Sister Christ, and anyone else out there. Okay. It's not nice to live here anymore, but we are strong and preserving. We do all things through Christ with strength of me. And we've got some Bible studies I'm going to try to put out this week. Just little, they're supposed to be small, but you know me, Brother Sister Christ. I love the Lord. I love His Word. I try to start out with a little small Bible study, and next thing you know, it ends up being an hour long. Sometimes a lot longer than an hour. But we are strong and preserve. We pray to our Lord that He may sustain us and that these wicked people may repent and get saved and born again. Absolutely. Amen. It starts with fearing God and repenting. That is why we would like to ask you to pray for us. It is mainly because we have openly renounced the Catholic faith, which does not fit according to their way, but their Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women doing the work of our Lord and Savior over there, brothers, sisters in Christ. We, I'm talking about them. They've denounced Catholicism, and now everybody's on them. You notice how that is, though, sometimes? If you try to keep quiet and just try to... Okay, I, I, you, there's some people who won't say anything. They won't say anything. Um, I, if I can pause right here, we'll get back to the letter. I was in town, and I came across a guy that was a Mexican uh, in descent... And he, he came from California, and he was part of a lot of the gangs and Hell's Angels and stuff like that. And he, he just turned 80, 
and he was talking with me that he went down to um, Mexico and he was with some of his family and everything and he was trying to do some witnessing and gospel you know he had, he had his King James Bible and everything and he was sitting there talking with them and when he got back home, evidently word got back that he's, you know, a Bible-believing Christian. He's a King James Bible believer. I talked with him with the gospel about the Bible version issue. The man loves the Lord. I came across somebody here that I believe is saved. <laughs> Remember I used to say, I think I'm the only one for a thousand. I found somebody. Um, but the story, because I, I, I want to get it right, but somehow along the story is that he offended some people down there, got called up to his family up here, so then when he got home, they got on to him. So then he called his family back down in Mexico and says, what's going on here? How come you never told them? Because he, when he went down there, they're like, we're King James Bible believers. We're Christians. We're not Catholics anymore. We're Christians. But they didn't have the courage and strength to tell their family up here in America that they're no longer Catholics. So he's like, he, got, you know, he kind of got stuck between the two. So... There's some people, I'm sorry, hopefully the point is, is there's some people that will get saved and they'll keep it quiet because they don't want to cause trouble in their family because their family is, is Catholic. But the moment you come out in the open and say, I renounce the Catholic Church, you put a big bullseye on your head. You're a big target. Amen. We hope every day that this may stop so that we may be able to continue living here. Otherwise, we are looking for a house outside the city where it is quieter and where mainly pe people like us live who want to serve our Lord. Because like I said, they go out to the villages and they're desperate for the, for the perfect written word of God, for the truth, the true plan of salvation, repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. And we're seeing in these last days... Brothers of Christ, I'm getting a little ahead of myself with the exhortation, but in these last days we're seeing how a lot of the brethren are having to move out to the countryside. Not out in the wilderness and hiding out in the wilderness, but having to leave the, the big cities and having to live in either smaller cities, excuse me, <coughs> having to live in the smaller cities, or having to go out in the countryside where you're just like 10 minutes, even 10 minutes, because I'm 10 minutes outside of town, on the mountainside. 10 minutes outside of town. You know, to get away from the, the vexation and the wickedness of the world and, and the dangers of everyday life. But this, what this brother says Christ talking about, is not just the dangers of everyday life, like people stealing and, and causing problems and stuff like that, but this is actual persecution. They gave their life to Jesus Christ, They've renounced the Catholic Church openly, and now they're a target in a community that's predominantly Catholic. Remember we prayed for another sister in Christ over in uh, England, where a lot of uh, Muslims are moving in, and they're trying to take over England <laughs> in certain cities. And if you're not Muslim, you're the enemy. And everything's just crazy over there, we had to pray for her. So let's... Um, let's try to finish this real quick. Otherwise, we're going to look for a house outside the city where it is quieter and where mainly people like us live who want to serve our Lord. Thank you in advance for reading this and praying for us. Kind regards from us, your family in Christ, the brother and sister in Christ. Brothers of Christ, sometimes some of us in America, we're kind of taking things for granted here. Don't be wrong, this country is, is gone. It's not a God-fearing country. We're not... This America is not biblically the King James Bible. They're not a Christian nation according to the Word of God. They're worldly. In other words, they fit in with the world's version, Satan's version of Christianity, not God's version. Okay. So we seem to have it easy here sometimes, brothers of Christ, and forget of our brothers and sisters in Christ overseas that are struggling. Okay. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians 11. Get out your King James Bibles and turn to 2 Corinthians 11. <laughs> this is Paul when you have somebody, you have people who whine about how hard it is. We just have it so hard. Or you have someone trying to brag. 
like we went through this, we went through, you know, like, what do you call it? When people try to make it out like, um, I'm trying to think of the word where persecution, that persecution complex. When people, some brethren out there start getting that persecution con complex. Look at me, look at me, look at what I'm going through for the Lord and how I'm suffering for the Lord. Paul has to get to a point where he says, I speak as a fool. You guys are acting foolish. Instead of praising God and thanking Him, remember, He glories in His infirmities. He praises God for everything He has to go through for Jesus Christ and for the gospel, the true gospel, not the fake, easy believism, repentless gospel of this world, this pagan, lost, false Christianity world, but true biblical salvation, repentance towards God, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, confessing both in prayer and asking God to save you, and preaching the changed life that's guaranteed to come when there's true conversion. When you truly get saved and born again, you're bought with a price. And he's getting thrown in prison, and he's, they're singing hymns in prison, and they're glorifying God to be counted worthy to suffer for his name's sake. And I'm not saying this is from Christ, they're, they're doing the same thing. But they're asking for prayer and, and help uh, in prayer. Um, but he's getting thrown in prison. He's getting beaten. He's getting run out of town. He had to be uh, in the early book of Acts when he first got saved. And he, on the road to Damascus, he went to Damascus. He had to be let down in a, in a basket because he, they, were after, they're, they were seeking to kill him. One time he was stoned. Sometimes we believe he was stoned to death, but it says supposing him to be dead. That means he wasn't dead. So, sometimes we want to say he was stoned to death. And that's how he had that, you know, that vision of the man being caught up. And him will I glory in, but me I'll glory in my infirmities. In other words, his suffering for Jesus Christ. But sometimes we forget, brother says Christ, that we're supposed to give God glory. To be, and, and give God praise and give God thanks to be counted worthy. To suffer for the true plan of salvation and for his word. And for the real Jesus Christ of Scripture, not these false Christs, these antichrists, these counterfeit Jesus Christs. Put, like if you put in parentheses, Jesus Christ, in other words, it's a false Jesus Christ. But the real Jesus Christ. Right? And these guys, someone's bragging, so Paul's like, okay, I'm going to speak like a fool. You think you've got it tough? You think you're so great? You starting to think more highly of yourselves than you ought to think? Putting yourself up on a pedestal? Or you start to get down and start being what I call that, uh, becoming a whiner or a complainer. I speak from experience, not with not just with other people. I'm talking about me. There's times I find myself whining and complaining instead of giving God glory, and instead of seeking out God. So he's like, well, I got to speak as a fool. So he starts going through his life as a Christian in Christ, Christian in Christ. His life being in the ministry. Serving the Lord, being part of the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, being in Christ. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11, start at verse 16. If you go back to 13, he's talking about where he has to deal with false, uh, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ, and no marvel for Satan himself is transformed to an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed in the ministries of righteous, whose end shall be according to their works. He's talking about those people he had to deal with. False converts, false brethren, which I'm getting ahead of myself. Verse 16 says, I say again, let no man think me a fool, if otherwise yet as a fool receive me, that I may boast myself a little. He normally wouldn't. He just praised the Lord for the past. You, a good man of God in ministry that loves the Lord, and, and serves him, and he's in the ministry, like it's a life calling, he's doing it for the Lord, he doesn't sit there and start uh, advertising every time he goes through hard times. In fact, you won't even know, you probably might only know a fraction of the hard times he goes through, the struggles he goes through, the hard times he goes through, what he has to put up with the lost world attacking him, what he has to put up with saved brothers and sisters in Christ turning on him sometimes, the falling away. You don't really know it that much. We're not supposed to be out there bragging. We give God the glory and we thank God for it. And the only time it really comes up with me, you know, when I have to, I can't support a ministry because someone's gone too far to the left or too far to the right and they're not staying the course. 
but it only come with me when I see someone else going through the same thing. I'll use my testimony of, hey, I've gone through what you're going through. Here's how God got me through it. And you use the scriptures to exhort the brethren. Okay? But Paul sitting here says, I may boast of myself a little, that which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were, foolishly, in the confidence of boasting. Remember what the Bible says in the Old Testament? Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceits. This is a good example of that. There's a time to answer a fool according to his folly, and there's a time not to answer a fool. Right? This is the time to answer a fool. He's like, you're acting foolish, so I'm going to show you that I'm going to act a little bit foolish to put you in your place and show you you don't have it hard. Verse 18, seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also. For ye suffer fools gladly, seeing yourselves are wise. Wise in their own eyes. I see a lot of brethren acting that way. Start acting wise in their own eyes. I see that hardcore with the lost world. Fools, the fool have said in his heart there is no God. And then you start acting foolish. Why are we starting to act like the lost world and starting to act wise in our own eyes? That's the way the world acts, the lost world. Okay? That's not how we're supposed to act. So he's putting them in their place. Verse 20, For ye suffer, if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself. We see that a lot lately. Men exalting themselves. If a man smite you on the face. I speak of concerning reproach as though we had been weak, howbeit we're in so... Wherensoever any is bold, I speak foolishly. I am bold also. Remember, he's speaking foolishly. People say he's being sarcastic. He's not being sarcastic. He's, being, he's, he's speaking the truth. But this is something we're not supposed to do. We're not supposed to be lifting ourselves up. We're not supposed to be patting ourselves on the back. We're supposed to be giving God all the glory. And that's what Paul normally does. But here you have all these people that are so puffed up with themselves... Wise in their own eyes. I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Remember this is 2 Corinthians. I've said this in all the Pauline epistles. You have Jews coming in and messing up the brethren trying to get them back into the Old Testament. Today it, it's, it's, it's not the Jews so much anymore. It is, it is Catholicism that tries to counterfeit the Jews. They have their own temple. They have their own priesthood. They have their own Levitical laws, their own ordinances. And they try to get people back under them, these false Christianity of the world. Okay? So am I. Are they seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. And labor... Remember? Are they ministers of Christ? Sometimes... You've really got to put some of the brethren in, that are trying to be in ministry. Maybe not uh, full proof of thy ministry. The Bible never says full ministry, full-time ministry. But it says to Timothy, make full proof of thy ministry. And there's a list that's required that you have to meet to be considered someone who's we, we call full-time ministry today that takes donations and stuff. And there's nobody on YouTube that meets those requirements. I'll tell you that right now. But you got some ministers that are getting so puffed up with themselves, so full of themselves, prideful, ego-driven. And he's like, I gotta put these guys in their place. I gotta pop that pride bubble, that ego bubble, and deflate them a little bit. And he says, I am more, and labor's more abundant, and stripes above measures, and prisons more frequent, and deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. And journeyings often, and perils in waters, and perils of robbers, and perils by mine own countrymen. Countrymen? Uh, the sister, brother, sister Christ, they're over there, and their own people are turning against them. I'm talking about uh, according to the flesh. And perils by the heathen? They think they're religious, but they're really falling, they're worshiping false gods. The, uh, uh, Satan is the lowercase g god of the Catholic Church, posing as gods, plural. 
of the Catholic Church. And perils in the city, that's where they live right now. That might be where you live, brothers and Christ. And perils in the wilderness, whoa, whoa, wait, no, we're, we're, I'm sorry, i got to kick this. We're running out to the wilderness to survive and to live and, and have peace and everything. There's nowhere you can run. Don't fall for this false teaching. You can live off-grid and you can uh, go out in the boonies and, and, and you'll be safe. Paul right here says, in perils in the wilderness. If you're truly serving God and you're going to where the people are, which is where you're supposed to be if you're serving God in ministry, whether it's in the wilderness, whether it's in the city, whether it's in the countryside, mountainside, valley, by the ocean, wherever. There is no safe harbor. There is no safe harbor. God will give you peace. God will protect you wherever you are. And God will let you go through some things for His glory, no matter where you are, where you're at. And perils in the wilderness, and perils in the sea, and perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness. Brothers of Christ, are we starting to feel some of this? We go through this and go, okay, I've been through this. How many of you that are saved and born again can go down some of this list of some of the things he's gone through and you're like, yep, since I got saved, that's happened to me. I've experienced that. I've gone through that. And weariness and painfulness. Okay. Back here, I'll go back a little bit. The heathen, all our countrymen, your family members turning against you. Okay. Um, and weariness and painfulness. And watchings often. And hunger and thirst. See, Paul taught for men, just going back to men in ministry, and this is a brother in Christ that's in ministry, and it goes back to what Paul was telling Timothy. He's like, if you get into real, real, I'll say it again, real ministry, where you're, it's a life calling and you're giving your whole life to it, uh, what we call full-time ministry, what Paul talks about making full proof of thy ministry, you've got to be content with food and raiment. It's not a business. It's not a monthly salary. That's what, that's what America and most of the world has become when it comes to even ones that claim to be King James Bible believers. They become a business. You're not supposed to be a business. You're not supposed to, you know, it's not supposed to be a monthly salary. That turns it into a business. These Babel buildings, they're businesses. They're money-making businesses. Paul says here, in hunger and thirst. I don't have this in my notes, but he also talked about that there was times he had abundance, there's times he barely got by, there's times where he was desperately in need. And he talks about a man in ministry that doesn't matter what state that you're in, I've learned to be there with content. God has taught me to be there with content. It's either God or the Lord has taught me to be with, there with content. Lord, Lord God Almighty. <laughs> right? Yeah. But some men get into ministry and they start falling into the trap of the love of money. They start getting into it for filthy lucre's sake. They start making merchandise of the brethren. You start compromising. So you don't have to suffer in this present world. You don't have to go through hard times. And fasting's often. I keep telling you this, brother says Christ, I'm learning this myself, that fasting does help you put the flesh down if you do it for the right reasons. Pray and fast. Pray and fast. And you spend a lot of more time with the Lord and His Word, and you do it with your heart and your mind on the Lord when you're fasting. It helps. It helps put the flesh down, and it helps you focus more on the Lord and His Word and the life that He has for you. Be more grateful, too, for the life that He has for you. Anything you were whining about, you go a few days in fasting, what you seem to be whining about seems to fade away. You know? In cold and nakedness. Besides those things that are without, he talked about a lot of things without, now he's come back into within, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. You know one of the biggest burdens that a, a man in ministry that hasn't lost his way, that isn't a fake and a fraud, isn't a hireling, one of the biggest burdens he has is for the body of Christ as a whole, the brethren. Remember Peter or Paul, I'm sorry, Paul, he talked about warning the brethren night and day with tears. He says, the wolves will come in and, and scatter the flock, and of your own selves shall men 
uh, arise speaking perverse things, brethren that are falling away, to draw away disciples after them. So when they fall away, they try they end up pulling people away and getting them to fall away. And he says, I cease not to warn you night and day with tears. You know, one of the biggest burdens he had was, which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. He's trying so hard to get the churches back on the right path. I mean, you read 1st and 2nd Corinthians, how he goes in there. He, he actually went to him three times. I try to explain people this. He went to him the first time. Then he goes back out to evangelizing to all the other churches and going around to all the other nations that God's calling him to go to. And then he hears that they're messed up. Someone came in and messed them up. So he comes back. He writes 1 Corinthians. And he goes back to see him. That's the second time. Gets him back on the right path. Then he goes back out doing the work of the Lord. And guess what? He hears they're, they've fallen back again. They've fallen flat on their face again. Someone's, so they let someone come right back in to mess up the flock. Some wolf to come in, or some brother is falling to the left or falling to the right. So then he writes 2 Corinthians. That's the third time. And you look at Galatians, the same thing with Galatians. He's having problems where somebody's coming in, or a brother in Christ is falling to the left or falling to the right, and they're causing problems in the body of Christ. The care of the churches. Okay. The reason I brought this in is Paul went through all of this. We got a brother and sister in Christ desperately wanting prayer because they're going, to, they're going through a persecution and they're going through some hard times and some fearful times. Now remember, God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. We fear God Almighty, not this world. But there's still times where we can get fearful. I still get fearful sometimes. And God's got to remind me, hey, do you trust me? Trust the Lord with all thine heart and lean not on thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. That series of studies we're going through. Right? Paul's desire to see his people get saved. Despite everything we just read there, you see what Paul went through and he's talking about. Well, why did he go through it? Because he was desperate to see people get saved. Gentile and Jew. But we're going to talk here about he went to the Jew three times. And three times he said, I'm done with you. But because of his heart and his love for his people, he kept going. This brother and sister in Christ can say, hey, we're done. It's getting too hard. We're done. We don't care. We're going to pack up and we're going to leave and everything. But they have a love for their people in, in Belgium. They have a love to see people get saved and become part of the body of Christ. They also have a love for those who got saved, their own brothers and sisters in Christ. But Acts chapter 9, verse 15. Acts chapter 9, verse 15. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. You see those three, three, three groups there. Did Paul fulfill those three groups? He, he did. I'm getting through uh, Acts right now. And he's talking to King Agrippa. And he preached the gospel to kings and Gentiles and Jews. Now turn over to Acts 13.44. Here's the first time where he really gets fed up. He gets so frustrated with the Jews. And it's like, I'm done with you. Acts 13.44, it says, And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitude, they were filled with envy. And spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing you put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. Sometimes it's hard to have that attitude. You know, we're going to get to this real quick. Let them alone. Let them alone. These easy believism. But you see, you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. They don't want to get saved. They love their sin. They love their worldliness. They love the old man. They don't want the new man. They don't want to be a new creature in Christ Jesus. The faith alone, easy believism, repentantless gospel. They don't want everlasting life. And I still find myself trying to reach them in my studies and everything. And I come across and I still try to reach them for the truth, true biblical repent, uh, salvation, repentance towards God. Have, repentance is having sorrow in your heart for sinning against God. 
God is nigh unto them that have a broken heart and save such that be of a contrite spirit. Unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. For God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. I'm trying to witness, but sometimes I get so fed up, uh, so frustrated with a lot of these faith alone people. I'm like, since you judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. And I'm going to get to that verse about let them alone, okay? But you get that point where we don't want anything to do with them. We're done with you. But then after a while, the burden still gets on our heart, and we still try again. We try to witness to them again. We try to reach them for the Lord again. Lo, we turn to the Gentiles, for so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light to the Gentiles, that they should be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. Remember Paul kept saying in all his letters that he's an apostle appointed by Jesus Christ himself to the Gentiles. Uh, turn over to Acts 18.4. He comes across Jews again, so what does he do? Does he just go, huh, I'm not doing it. The burden on his heart, his love for his people, his love to see people, his love for the gospel, and to see people get saved for the Lord and the gospel, to see people get saved. Acts 18.4. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ, the King of the Jews. Okay. Son of the living God, but also their King that they crucified. Verse 6. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed. I've seen a lot of Jews do that. They'll blaspheme. And they oppose themselves that reject Jesus Christ. He shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. It comes down to that point, Brother Suppress, where are you trying? If you're, if you're trying to give... Reach people for the gospel, witness to all your neighbors. I've handed out gospel tracts to my neighbors, uh, booklets. Uh, I've gone down there and tried, and I keep going as long as I'm allowed to hand out gospel tracts. The doors are open. I'm still able to hand people. I'm so blessed in the last month, I was able to hand like three or four people face to face a gospel tract and try to witness to them, verbally witness to them. Right? The doors haven't been closed completely yet. Um, but if you're trying your best, that's what Paul's doing. He's saying, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. I tried to preach the truth to you. You don't want the truth. Henceforth, I will go unto the Gentiles. It's hard to have that attitude. It really is. Especially if it's family members that you love and care about. You know? uh, turn over to Acts 28-23. Here's the third time. And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning till evening. These are Jews. And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that Paul had spoken one word, well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet of our father, saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall not hear, and shall not I'm sorry, hearing ye shall ye shall hear and shall not understand. You know that thing about going in one ear and out the other? <laughs> I've come across a lot of people that that. I went and got my um, pretzels at the bakery, and as I was coming out, some guy walked over to my truck, because it's got all my uh, gospel magnets on it, and, and two big magnets that are on there talks about heaven and hell, which place are you going to go to? You can, there's only two places to go, heaven or hell. Where will you spend eternity? And he came up, and he's like, so let me get this straight. You believe that, you know, there's, there's just heaven and hell. And I was like, that's what the Bible teaches. And he's like, well, what about that 13th tribe in the Old Testament uh, that was in the wilderness, and the wilderness opened up and swallowed them up. And I'm sitting here going, I, I, was, I, I didn't do that. I was looking at the Bible. <laughs> I have a Bible, a Bible in my door. I was looking over at the Bible. And I was like, Lord, did I miss something? Did I, did I miss something? No, this guy was clueless. And he says, what happened to those people? 
And I'm sitting there and I was like, well, first of all, that doesn't change the fact that there's a heaven and there's a hell. And you're going to one of those places. But there was only 12 tribes, not 13. And, the, and when they were wandering in the desert, you know, the, desert, the desert, I didn't get to this point, but the desert consumed the elderly people. But there was no the ground opening up and swallowing them up and everything. And when, like I said, he just took little parts from all over the Old Testament that he, he probably heard. But I still don't understand where he got 13 tribes. But it's like, it's in one ear and right out the other. Because I tried talking to him. Thank God I was able to give him one of my gospel tracts before. I always learn that. That's something you have to learn. Hand him the gospel tract. You'll see him take it, put it in their pocket, and then talk with them. Because you can get to talking with them and they could either say, I don't, I don't reject what you say and storm off. Or they'll be like, eh, I don't know. And, then, and they walk away and you forget to give them the gospel tract. So I, I've learned to give him the gospel track ASAP. So I was like, well, here, this tells you the whole truth and what the scriptures say about salvation. And then we start talking a little bit. And he, he got in his truck and, you know, popped out a cigarette and starts, and starts off down the road on his way to hell. The place that he was looking for, he was trying to find a way out. Other, he was trying to find a way out of hell he doesn't mind going to heaven. I don't know if you can see that, but it's Christ going to heaven. But he doesn't want to abide by the whole... That's a picture of a Bible, whole, holy Bible. But he doesn't want to do it God's way. He's trying to find some way out of it. There's times I preached the gospel, I ran across the guy. He was looking for every loophole possible. He was trying to find something wrong with what I said. Trying to find some error in my... He looked at me saying it's my feelings and opinions and my reasonings, but I kept quoting scripture to him. He kept getting mad. You're trying to tell me what to think again. That's not somebody who's ready for salvation. That's someone whose heart's still too hardened. It needs to be softened up a little bit. It needs to be broken. The man wasn't broken. But it's always in one ear and out the other. And saying, hearing you shall hear and shall not understand. And seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. For the heart of these people is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing. And their eyes have they closed. Some of the people I try to witness to, they try to come up and find some flaw in, in the Word of God. They come up and try to find some flaw in the true plan of salvation. See, what gets me is you got these easy believism. And if I told them all you had to do was believe and you're in, you don't have to change your life. You can continue in sin that grace may abound. And you can uh, make provisions for the flesh to, to fulfill the lust thereof. And, you know, just put it on the cross. Just treat the cross as a credit card. And just say you believe and go have some fun. Flesh is fun. Fun is flesh. They'd all jump up and down about getting saved. But when I preach the true plan of salvation that leads to a changed life where they have to come broken and be in sorrow, sorry for their personal sins that they've sinned against God that put them on the cross, what God is saving you from, they want nothing to do with it. And they fight you. They want nothing to do with it. People love the easy believism, but true salvation, here's the thing, true salvation, it's simple, but they mess it up. I've, I've heard people say the simplicity of the gospel, and they start preaching like easy believism. Faith alone. That's garbage. They're messing it up. The gospel is simple. Repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer, and ask God to save you. But here's the thing they keep saying sometimes. The gospel's easy. No, it ain't. If the gospel was easy, everybody would get saved. Why? Because that's what the, the false gods the lowercase g God, Satan of this world, that's what he keeps promising them. That it's easy. And they buy it hook, line, and sink it. They want easy. They want lazy. They want easy. If the true plan of salvation was easy, everybody would get saved. It's not easy. It's not easy to come to the end of yourself. How many of us have good testimonies can testify that you're like, why didn't I get saved sooner? You beat yourself up. I wish I had gotten saved sooner. Why? Why didn't I get saved sooner? Because I was too indulged in the flesh and worldliness. I loved my sin. I didn't want to give up. I didn't want to throw that old man at the foot of the cross. 
Now, I'm not saying you clean up your, your life and then get saved. You get saved first, and God who, who cleaned up my life. When He gave me that new man, that new birth, I was a new creature in Christ Jesus. I was bought with a price. I'm not my own. He cleaned up my life. But I came to Him and said, Hey, here's the old man. I'm giving my life to you on the cross. You gave my, your life for me. I'm giving my life to you. You're to present your bodies a living sacrifice. It's your reasonable service. And I came to him after salvation and said, I want the new life. Have you ever stopped to think about that with all these false Christian, Christians out there, false religions out there with like faith alone and easy believism? They don't want the new life. They don't want the new birth. The new life defined by the Bible. What God says is right, what God says is wrong, what God's, how God says we're supposed to live. How God says we're supposed to be, you know, what we're supposed to do as Christians, the body of Christ, how it's supposed to operate, looking for that blessing. They don't want the changed life. Then why'd you get saved? I'm sorry, just going off on a little tangent a little bit. Just it's frustrating. Being out there in ministry trying to preach the gospel, you start hearing all kinds of crazy things. But the number one thing I hear out there is from people who profess to be already saved is. They took the easy way. Not the simple gospel, it's simple, but they tried to find a back door. If you go to my list of uh, salvation videos, one of them is finding the back door, question mark. They're always trying to find the easy way in. They don't want to go through the front door. They don't want to go do things the way God says to do them. And that's what Paul has to deal with, mainly with the Jewish people here. 27, for the heart of this people is waxed gross. Wait, you mean it's a heart issue? Not a head issue? You miss heaven by 13 inches? You have the knowledge? That's all these easy believers have. They have just the knowledge. I know that from experience. You want to know why? Because I was one of them. At 12 years old, I was indoctrinated into the faith alone, free grace, and not... And remember, when I say free grace, the Bible doesn't say free grace. God's grace is what saves us, and He gives us a gift of everlasting life, which we just read about there, everlasting life, and that gift is a free gift. That grace costs something. It costs somebody something. It costs God the Father, His Son, Jesus Christ on the cross. There was a cost. Where's that sorrow? Oh, no, no, there's no repentance. There's no... You're dealing with lost people trying to find the back door. They don't want to come to God on His terms. They don't want to give their life to Jesus Christ. My, you look, talk to these people. Their life is their own. Their life is their own. Nobody bought me. I, nobody rules me. Nobody tells me what to do. I came across uh, a woman on here whining and complaining because I said, when you get truly saved and born again, God is our commander-in-chief. He's our capital K king of lowercase k kings, capital L lord of lowercase lord. He commands, we obey. We belong to him. And she got upset about that. And she tried to steal that verse that says, Ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. See there, Jesus wants to be our friend. But she ignored where it says, If you do whatsoever I command you. And if the verse before says, There's no greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. Ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. In other words, did you give your life to Jesus Christ on the cross? That woman didn't. Her life is her own. Nobody tells me what to do. Especially God Almighty, who's creator of heaven and earth, who created all things. No man tells me what to do. No one tells me what to do. I'm my own boss. I decide my own fate. That's what Paul's dealing with with these Jews. For their heart of this people is wax gross. The Bible says that Jesus is a stone, and those that fall on him shall be broken. You know, God is nigh unto them that have a broken heart, and say it such that we have a contrite spirit. But though th those that this rock falls on, it will grind them to dust. If they wait too long, when they go to stand before the Lord God Almighty, Jesus Christ, at the white throne, great white throne, he's the one that's going to be grounding them into powder. It's too late. The time to repent is now. Repent and believe. And I keep trying to reach those people, those easy believing peoples. 
but boy, did they come back and attack. Um, it was the first page. But what this brother and sister Christ is going through, they're trying to witness to him, teach him, preach the truth to him, and boy, do they get attacked for it. And boy, do I get attacked from the easy believism crowd. Lately, I've been getting attacked by my own brethren. My brother and sister Christ, I believe, is saved, and I'm getting attacked by them. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and they will hear it. And the, like I said, I believe the, the proper title for this time period is not church age. And we've done studies on this. When you say church age, that's false. It's not only that the Bible doesn't say it, it actually starts causing problems where you start going against the Bible. Because you can grab from the church in the wilderness the Old Testament. You can grab things from the Old Testament and apply it today because it said church. You grab things for the time of Jacob's trouble and you try to apply it today because it said church. Church just means called out assembly, a group of people that are called out to be separate from the world that belong to God. The Jews in the Old Testament were a church. There are people that were called out from the world to be separate from the world that belong to God. Today it's the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. In the time of Jacob's trouble, there are going to be saints in the time of Jacob's trouble. You gotta be careful. But this time period is called the time of the Gentiles. Why? Because the church is gonna be predominantly Gentile. For the last two thousand years, if you were doing the percentage wise, I'd be I wouldn't be surprised if ten percent of all Christians in two thousand years are Jews. When this was first started, there was a lot of Jews getting saved. But that kind of fizzled out. There's still some Jews saved today, but not many. Some of them have, have some have gone over to Catholicism. A lot of them, actually not some, a lot of them have gone over to Catholicism. And they'll claim they're Christians, but they're not. They betrayed their people to Catholicism. The number one group of people, uh, organization in this world that has hunted them down and killed a lot of Jews, killed a lot of real Christians, and yet you have people today professing to be Christians that are starting to shake hands with the Catholic Church. Sorry to go off on that tangent a little bit. But, brothers of Christ, it's hard. It's hard getting out there in these last days trying to preach the truth to people. I've talked to a brother in Christ and I said, you know what makes it so hard? Is every person I've ever tried to witness to, regardless if they're already an organized religion, they have some idea of Jesus Christ. But even the ones that are like atheists, even the ones that are just, I forgot what you call it when you're, they're trying to be spiritual, like Buddhism, but like they're just spiritual. You go to them and you try to witness to them and try to preach Jesus Christ to them. They already have some idea of a Jesus Christ. Their idea and their, you know, they've already been tainted is another, the word I'm looking for. They've already been tainted. That truth that you're trying to give them, someone's already come by and perverted that truth and given them a perverted story. A false Christ, an antichrist, sowing bad seeds. You, Brothers and sisters, you do realize the enemy is also sowing seeds. Satan loves to counterfeit Jesus Christ. He's got his own counterfeit of the Jewish people, which is the Catholic Church. Okay, He's a counterfeit for Jesus. That's why he likes to transform himself into an angel of light. Because the angel of the Lord, an angel of the Lord, that man, the captain of the host of heaven, is Jesus Christ. And his ministers are also transformed into the ministers of righteousness, whose ends shall be according to their works. He's a counterfeit. And you have the parable of the sower. Remember, the sower is the son of man. That parable is for when Jesus Christ was there. We can learn from it how people react to truth. We're, we're seeing how Paul, how the Jews are reacting to the truth that Paul has given them. But remember, that parable of the sower is not doctrinally for today, because the sower is not me. The sower there is not Paul. It's not Peter. The Bible says the sower is the capital S Son of Man. And when Jesus is referred to as the Son of Man, it's talking about he's the Christ, the King of the Jews. And his family line goes back to King David, and he's a king. And he's there to be the King of the Jews. But you see, he's a sower, and he's sowing the truth 
And it's a story about how this truth falls on this group of people, this truth falls on that group of people, this truth, and how they react. Satan's a counterfeit. He's got people out there sowing bad seeds too. And I get out there, I haven't come across one person that's never heard of Jesus Christ. Ever. Any. A Jesus Christ, this version of Jesus Christ, that version. Never heard, I've never come across one person. We're in the last days and it's so hard to preach the gospel these days. Because we got to break through the lies. we got to break through these false ideas that people have of a Jesus Christ and try to reach them for the real Jesus Christ with the true plan of salvation. It's not easy. Uh, doors closing for ministry in, in, that, in any area. People not wanting the truth. Uh, I'm going to go through these real quick. Colossians 4.3 with, with all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am in, also in bonds. All right. Once doors open to preach the truth. In Revelation 3.20, in Revelation 3.20, we read, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. We're throwing seeds so Jesus can knock on the door. But these people have to open the door and let them in. You have to repent. You have to believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. You have to confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. Throwing the old man at the foot of the cross, getting ready for a new man when God saves you. Okay? But we throw out the seeds. God does the knocking. Remember Paul said, I've, I've planted a polis of water, but God gives the increase. It's Jesus Christ that stands at the door and knocks. He's praying that, that he might open some doors for us to witness. And when those doors open for us to witness, we plant the seeds so God will start knocking on their heart, the door of their heart. In Romans 10, 16 it says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who believeth our report? There gets a point where you're in an area where it's like the doors start closing. Those doors that Paul's at saying, hey, I want to preach the gospel. Doors are open, I'm going to preach it. And the doors close. Uh, 1 John 4, 5. 1 John 4, 5 says, They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. No matter how much we try to witness to some people, you can get to an area where you're trying to witness, and you're trying to witness, and nobody wants the gospel. And they're just going to fight you. Job 41.24 says, His heart is as firm as a stone. This is Job 41.24. I found this because it's always a heart issue. These, these easy believers and this faith alone, these people that have this false Christ in their head, this antichrist spirit, their hearts are pretty much, they're, they're, we're trying to break through the heart, and try to soften the heart. So that's not my job. I have to stop there and correct myself. I keep trying to break their heart and soften. That's not my job. My job is to preach the truth to them and plant seeds. God will tear up the ground. That's why I disagree with some of the brethren. They'll say, we've got to tear up the ground if you want to plant seeds. No, you throw seeds and God will take care of digging up the ground and making sure the right seeds, when you're sowing seeds, that they'll fall on people. We're looking for those people that God has broken up the ground. The Bible says the Holy Spirit goes in, out to the world to reprove the world of sin. God does the breaking. We preach the truth. And we're seeking those people who want it. God's broken them. They're ready. Now we start planting seeds. And the seed starts growing. But lately what it seems like we're dealing with is his heart is a, as firm as a stone. Yea, his heart is a piece of a nether millstone. And you come across people like that. Part of false religions. Indoctrinated. We want to say brainwashed, but more than anything, they're just indoctrinated, and they don't want to give up what they have in this world. Their false religion, lusts of the flesh, things of the world. Matthew 7, 6, we read, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. 1 Corinthians 14, 38 says, But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. You say, brother, what's the whole point of all this? When a door closes for ministry, God will usually open up another one. But if you're in an Eric's, if my advice to this brother says Christ, they know what's going on over there more than I do. But like he said, is if you're moving out to the, the to the countryside is safer and you're continuing the work of the Lord, do it. But my advice to all the brethren is this. Make sure the doors have closed before you take off. 
make sure the doors have actually closed. And if they've actually closed, by all means, time to, the next part of this, time to move to another city. There's some times where you've done your best, praise the Lord, you did the work of the Lord. There's a lot of times where Paul, they start going after him, they start causing trouble and said, what did Paul do? Did he sit there and keep fighting them and fighting them? Come on, let's go, let's go. Or did he go, okay, I'm going to go over here now and preach the truth. I don't know, how, I've gone through, I'm going through Acts right now. There's a lot of times where they sought his life, so they sent him down on the basket at Damascus, and he goes to Jerusalem to preach the gospel. Okay, he's over here, they stone him, so he gets up, goes back in to the brethren to say goodbye, and he moves and goes somewhere else. When the doors close, he goes somewhere else. Sometimes he comes back, because maybe the door opened back up for him to come back. But you read all about Paul. There's a lot of times where Paul said, okay, I'm done, I'm going over here. God says, okay, I, I, I want you're done there, you're to go over here. There's times where he says, don't go here. There's times where he said, don't go to Asia, but go over here. And then later on down the road, a door opened up, and then he says, okay, now go over to Asia. And so on and so forth. God's the one that opens doors, like he called for in Colossians 4.3, and God's the one that closes door. So when God closes the door, it seems like, there's no, like, if I couldn't gospel tract here at all, in this, let's just say this county, this area passed the law, no more gospel tracting, no more street witnessing, and the people here, they don't want the Lord, they don't want salvation. You've tried, you've tried, and God goes, you know what? They don't want it. Look at that county, two, two counties over, you can still witness, you can still gospel tract, People are still getting saved. They still want the truth. Why don't you go over there and, and, and put forth your energy and your effort over here? Okay. When the doors close, Matthew chapter 10, 14. <clears throat> and whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when you depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust for your feet. Parallel passage, Mark 6, 11. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear you, when ye depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. Luke 9.5 says, And whosoever shall not receive you, when ye go out of the city, shake off the very dust from your feet for a testimony against them. I tried. That's what the shaking off the dust was. You went in to preach the truth with people that have dust and dirt on them. God can clean them. God can heal them. But you go and you brush the dust off your feet. Okay, I tried. I tried to lead you to Christ. I tried to preach the true plan of salvation to you. I tried to preach the Bible version issue. You know, I'm not allowed to speak. My mom and dad, I tried witnessing to my mom. I tried preaching the Bible version issue. I tried preaching the true plan of salvation. And I've been commanded by my mom, I'm not allowed to talk about the Word of God and Jesus Christ to them. I've been cut off. At first, it, it, was, it, was, it hurt my heart. I want to see my, my mom and dad get saved. My brothers, I'd like to see them get saved. I've got an older brother and a younger brother. I was the middle child. I'd like to see them get saved. But the door closes. I tried, I tried, I brushed the dust off my feet. It's not always easy. Don't get me wrong, if a door opens, I'm going to jump at it to try to witness to my mom and dad again. But God's got to soften their heart and God's got to open up a door for me to witness again. But right now, that door's closed. Brush off the feet, dirt off your feet, and go somewhere else. I'm preaching the gospel. I'm uh, doing Bible studies with brethren. I'm trying to put out Bible studies to exhort you, brothers. I'm still doing the work of the Lord. I just can't do it with my mom and dad. The doors have closed. Acts 13, 49. You say, well, that's just Old Testament. That was the kingdom of heaven gospel. And it was. When you're reading Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he's talking about the gospel of kingdom of heaven. But the gospel's... A, it's the, the instruction righteous there is when you're trying to preach truth and someone doesn't want the truth, you move on to the next city. You see that all with Acts with Paul. When someone didn't want the truth, he went somewhere else. Acts 13.49, but here's Acts 13.49, transition, but it says, And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region, but the Jews stirred up the devout honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coast. But they shook off the dust of their feet against them and just went right back in and kept trying. No, it says they brushed off the, feet, uh, the dust of the feet against them and came to Iconium. They went somewhere else. 
Okay, we're going to try the witness here and see what happens. See if there's somebody who wants the truth. Nobody wants it? Okay, we're going to go over here now. They don't stay there force-feeding the truth to people who don't want it. What happens when you force-feed the truth to people who don't want it? You're casting pearls before swine, that which is holy among the dogs. They'll turn around and rend you. So that brother says, Christ, in these last days, my first thought is, to, I'm just to be honest, my first thought would be to jump on there and say, yeah, I'll make a run for it and go live outside town and everything. But you know what's going on. That goes with all the brothers of Christ. I don't know what's going on specifically in your life where you are at. I've had brethren hit me up thinking about moving out here. I have. And you know what the first thing in my heart says? Yes! Having a brother in Christ out here, sisters and brothers in Christ out here, where I can witness to, or go witnessing with, that I can preach the gospel, uh, preach the gospel, preach the uh, word of God face to face, Bible studies face to face instead of using cameras. Um, you know, you know, have uh, that fellowship that's face to face, in person fellowship. But you know what God does? He's got to rein me in, you know, like a fishing rod. He's got to rein me in and say, wait, 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 wait. And I talk to him. I say, listen, if there, if you feel like you're the only Bible believing, God fearing man or woman for miles, and God still has doors open for gospel tracting and witnessing, not women aren't evangelists. Men can be evangelists. But women aren't evangelists, but we're all called in the ministry of reconciliation. We can all gospel track. We can all witness for Jesus Christ. You come across somebody and they say something, and you're like, oh, wait a second. That's an open door. Now I can witness to them, give them my testimony of how Jesus saved me. And if he can save me, he can save you. If those doors haven't closed... I try to tell myself, if those doors haven't closed and God's got you there, then God's got you there for a reason. The only time you'd really want to jump up and down, because I've always wanted to have a house church. You know me, brothers of Christ. I want desperately love to be part of a house church. Brethren are coming together. We're doing things God's way. We have ordained elders, bishops, deacons. We have, you know, a group of people who want to go out and gospel track. Uh, you know, uh, more than one preacher and teacher where there's accountability. I want to do things God's way. I want to be able to sing hymns with brethren. I desperately want a house church. But I want what God wants first and foremost before what I want. His will be done before my will, in other words. And I tell him, I said, listen, if the doors aren't closed, the doors aren't closed, then continue fighting the good fight where you're at. Continue fighting the good fight. I want a house church. I will not turn anybody down that wants to come out here and be part of a house church. I won't. But I always tell them, you need to pray about it, and you need to make sure it's what God wants and not what you want. It's what God wants, not what Philip Newton wants. All right? It's got to be of God. All right? So real quick, a couple of encouraging verses to these brothers and sisters in Christ that wrote the letter, and to all the brethren out there that are going through hard times with persecutions, mainly overseas, are going through scary times, which here in America, here in the next few months, we might be going through some scary times. Remember, we're supposed to be a living witness and a verbal witness. We're supposed to be putting on the whole armor of God. We're supposed to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Continue keeping your life clean. Sanctification. Keep evil, evil out of your life and sin and wickedness out of your life. Pardon me. Pardon me. Keep living a life of Christ, being in Christ Jesus. Being that light of Je being a light for Jesus Christ to the world. But as you're doing the work of the Lord, encouragement, 2 Corinthians 4.14. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus, shall raise up us also by Jesus, and shall present us with you. Don't forget that blessed hope. We're working towards that judgment seat of Christ. Or we're going to have to answer for our life as a Christian, how we get to go into eternity and spend eternity with our Lord and Savior. That's what I believe. But we're looking for that blessed hope. Don't let someone take your eyes off that blessed hope. Don't let your flesh do it. Don't get distracted by the world and take your eyes off the blessed hope. Don't let other brethren that have taken their eyes off that blessed hope get you to do it. They're so distracted by the world, that's all they want to talk about. World, world, what happened to the Word of God? What happened to preaching the Word and being instant in season and out of season? Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. What happened to that? Some of the brethren have forgotten that. And they're becoming talk shows and reaction shows and they're getting distracted by the world. And they're getting us distracted by the world. Keep your eyes on that blessed hope. 
and living for Jesus Christ. Verse 15, For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. Give God thanks in all things, especially when you're going through hardship, persecutions. They, this brother and sister Christ, they scratch their car, and it's because they're Christians. Praise the Lord. To God be the glory. Sing a hymn. And give God glory. Spend some time praising God and worshiping God when you're going through hard times. You get those letters? Praise God. Sing a hymn. Read some of the Word of God. Pray. I know it can still get fearful sometimes, especially for men who have families. Men who have wives and children they're supposed to take care of. Okay? It gets a little bit fearful for uh, sisters in Christ that have children. Sons and daughters that they fear for. They get fearful for. But remember, when we go through hard times... And it's because of, not because I go through hard times sometimes, because I choose the wrong choice. I choose the flesh over the Lord. Okay? You choose the world over the Lord. You start listening to Satan and his ministers, the three enemies. If you go through hard times because you're giving in to the three enemies, you need to get your heart right with the Lord. Get back to lining up with the Word of God. But if you're lined up with the Word of God and you're going through hard times, remember, we're supposed to give God glory in it. Give Him thanks to be counted worthy to suffer for His namesake. Verse 16, For which cause we faint not, but though our, though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. That brother says, Christ, I know they're doing it, but I still like to tell everybody, make sure you're staying in the Word of God every day. You start your day with the Word of God in prayer, maybe even sing a hymn. And you end your day with the Word of God, and maybe sing a hymn, <laughs> you know. But you start with the Lord, you end it with the Lord, and make sure you're praying without ceasing. You always got your eyes on that blessed hope, and you're meditating on the Lord and His Word night and day. He'll renew, the inward man was renewed day by day. Verse 17, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Whilst we look not at the things which are seen, they scratched up your car. But the things which are not seen, those are rewards in heaven. They scratched your car up because they hate you as a Christian, that's a reward in heaven. If they scratched your car out because you lost your temper and started calling them names, eh, you still got with you. We're not supposed to act like that. We're supposed to be gentle unto all men and meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. We're not supposed to get in fight with the lost world. But if you're going through persecution, which I believe this brother says Christ is, there's rewards in heaven. For the things which are seen are temporal. What you're going through down here, brother says Christ, is just temporal. It's temporary. But the things which are not seen are eternal. Remember what Paul said? The thi uh, the Suffering of this present world are not to be compared to the glory that awaits us. Don't take your eyes off, the, off the, of that blessed hope. Don't take your eyes off of it. Keep giving God glory. Keep fighting the good fight. Okay. Galatians 6.9 says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Keep doing the work of the Lord. Keep doing the work of, of, of you know, the ministry of reconciliation. Staying in the Word, being a living witness and a verbal witness. We're all ambassadors for Jesus Christ. And when he said that, let us not be weary in well-doing. Uh, Romans 12, 17 says, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Some brethren forget that. I live peacefully among my brethren to a point. I've had the one guy up there get mad at me several times. I preached the gospel to him and he got mad. But for the most part, I've tried. They've rejected Jesus Christ, but I'm not a jerk. I don't hang out with them in their sin. But when they need help, I'm there to help them. When, and then they help me. I live peaceably among my neighbors. Sometimes you get that neighbor that really hates you because you're a Christian. The guy up the way thought I was a Catholic. And I had to set him straight and say, I'm not a Catholic, I'm a King James Bible believer. And tried to witness to him. And the guy just sat there and just was mocking God and blaspheming. and Kind of like what Paul had to go through with the Jews. He's just blaspheming the Lord. And some, some of the neighbors don't even talk to me. 
but they're not trying to seek my destruction, not yet anyway. It's, it's probably coming, it's probably coming. But the whole point is, is if it be possible, live peacefully with all men. It says all men. Not just saved, all men. Right? doesn't say we're supposed to hang out with them in their sin. I get invited to neighbors where they're doing parties and there's alcohol present, there's satanic style music present, there's immodestly dressed women present. I don't go over there. I turn them down. No, nope, don't do it. But when they say, hey, I need help moving something. Oh yeah, I'll help you. Let me help you move that. And there's times where there's been doors that opened up where I can witness a little bit more. Hey, I need someone to watch my dog for me. We're, we're leaving for the week. Yeah, I'll watch your dog for you. I do dog sitting for some of the neighbors. I, I do, uh, I help watch, a lot of the neighbors like me have chickens and livestock. So I, I get to watch a lot of animals and stuff. I help them out. If it, live peaceful with all men. But when you're stuck with this brother and sister Christ, when you're stuck in a situation where you're trying to be peaceful and they're not trying to be peaceful, maybe it's time to move on to another city. Or at least, like he said, move outside the city. Protect your family. 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will, pay, will repay, saith the Lord. I keep saying this, brother. Give it to the Lord. Give your anger to the Lord. Or that anger is going to turn to bitterness, and it's going to turn to hate. If you're angry with the brother with the cause, give it to the Lord. If you're angry without a cause, get your heart right with the Lord. There's some brethren that are angry without a cause. They're the ones at fault. There's times I've been angry, and God has to show me, hey, you're the one that's at fault. I need to get my heart right with you, Lord. There's times I've been angry with brethren, and frustrated with brethren with a cause, I, you know, I have every right to be. But if I didn't give it to the Lord, I know what's going to happen. It's going to turn to bitterness, and that bitterness is going to turn to hate. And I've seen some brethren on here that I believe are saved. They have a lot of hate for the brothers and sisters in Christ. They start to have hate for the lost world. And instead of true love for the lost world, what's true love for the lost world? Preaching the gospel to them. Preaching the truth to them. Desiring to see them get saved. What's loving your brothers and sisters in Christ? Being there for them. And if for any reason they got to get put out, you don't treat them like an enemy, but admonish them as a brother, the Bible says. And you love them and you seek them to come back to the right path. You want to see them get back on their, on their feet. You want them back in the fellowship, living right, doing right according to this book. Not me, this book. But you don't start treating your brothers and sisters in Christ the way the lost world treats you. Or let's say a brother says Christ treats you bad, you don't turn around and treat them bad. The lost world treats you bad, you don't turn around and treat the lost world bad. I've always said this before, if they, mock, if they call you names, you don't call them names. If they mock you, you don't mock them, even if it's coming from saved or lost. In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, that poor adventure they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil that are taken captive by him at his will, captive by him at his will. You don't reward evil with evil, but overcome evil with good. Here we're going to get into that. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. The Bible talks about whose damnation is just. You're supposed to be kind. You're supposed to be good to the people around you. And if they continue rejecting Jesus Christ when they die, and they end up standing before Jesus Christ, the great white throne judgment, shall heap coals of fire on their head, whose damnation is just. They're just adding more to what God's going to hold them accountable for. Okay. You say, what if it's a saved person? Um... Coals of fire, the judgment seat of Christ. Moral rewards that they're going to lose at the judgment seat of Christ. More that they're going to have to answer for. We're all going to have to answer to Jesus Christ someday. Saved at the judgment seat of Christ. And, I mean, sorry, I say saved, but the body of Christ, how we get saved today. The body of Christ, the bride of Christ is going to be at the judgment seat of Christ. And then, time of Jacob's trouble, day of the Lord, Satan's let loose for a season, then you get the great white throne judgment. Everyone else is going to be judged there. Primarily the lost world, a lot of them are going to be lost, but there might be some saved that are judged there too. But everyone, everyone gets judged by Jesus Christ someday. Everyone does. 
When we get judged, our salvation doesn't get judged. Jesus said it is finished. If you truly repented and believed in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, ask, uh, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you, your salvation is not what's getting judged as far as eternal salvation. What's getting judged is your life as a Christian, how you get to spend that eternity, that gift that's a free gift of everlasting life. How do you get to spend that? Heaping coals of fire on his head. Verse 21, be not overcome of evil. What does it mean by that? In other words, when people are evil to you, don't turn around and start doing the same thing to them. It overcomes you and you become like them. Don't become like them, brother, says Christ. Don't become like them. Be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. I've said this before. I've talked to brethren that disagree with me on the Godhead. They believe the Godhead I believe, but they disagree with me when it comes to using all the Catholic pagan terms, Trinity terms, Trinity, Triune, you know, God three persons, which the Bible doesn't teach, uh, God the Son, which the Bible doesn't teach, God the Holy Spirit. The means definitive. It makes him separate from all other gods. And they'll say, that's not true. Yeah, it is. That's English. That's proper English. But hey, today, proper English just goes out the window. But the point is, I got into it with the brother in Christ, and I tried to keep my calm, I tried to be respectful, and he got angry, and we went our separate ways. A few months down the road, he comes back and says, you know what, brother, I apologize. I lost my temper, I was mean to you, you didn't get mad at me, you didn't get mean to me, and you know what, I looked back into it some more, and you're right. If the Bible doesn't say it, I need to say it the way that God says it. I need to believe what God says, not what man says. I need to believe absolute truth, not root, uh, spoiled by philosophy, not philo what philosophy says, not what traditions of men says, spoiled by philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, not what the world says, and not after Christ. I need to be after Christ. What does he actually say? Does God say faith alone? Does God say free grace? Does God say easy believism? Does God say trinity? Does God say church age? Church age? Does God say rapture? Does God say millennial kingdom? Does God I can keep going down the list. There's a lot more on the list. But the whole point was is I tried to keep calm and I tried to be respectful and I started and I tried to preach the truth to him in love with uh, boldness. The boldness is this is the truth I ain't budging. That's boldness, but you can do it without being a jerk. You can do it without, you know, there's some ways that I came across when I was newly saved that I was purposely coming across that was hardening their heart. Okay? Sometimes I'd say things in a way that I knew would upset them. Not because I was preaching truth. I mean, I said it specifically, waiting to see if I could get a rise out of him and then laugh about it. Ooh, no, no, no. I was wrong. That's not how we're supposed to do it. We're supposed to preach the truth with the intent to want to see people get the truth. I want to see people get saved. I want to see people come out of the false religions like I did. The, especially the false faith alone religion that's nowhere in the scriptures. I want to see them have to change life. I want to see them be in Christ Jesus our Lord. I want them to be one of our brothers. So I keep preaching the truth to them. And the Bible says we're supposed to preach the Word of God in sincerity and in truth. Sincerity means being sincere, means being serious. We're not supposed to do it out of pride, preach the truth out of pride. We're not supposed to do it out of bitterness, out of hate, out of spite, out of envy. I can go down the list. We're supposed to do it with truth but overcome evil with good. And this brother and sister Christ is doing the best they can to praise God. Okay? Make sure, brother and sister Christ, that we're praying for everyone. That you're praying, you're taking time out every day. It used to be something, well, we can do it once a week, but I'm getting to the point where it seems like I, I, can, or don't, I can't see going a day without mentioning it to the Lord in prayer about the brethren. I really am thinking about you, brother and sister Christ, and praying for you, and really concerned for you. And brethren ask me, it says the same thing with me. My walk with the Lord is the most important thing. I pray for your walk with the Lord. I pray for um, 
your safety when it comes to the world devouring one another. But if you have to suffer for Jesus Christ, I pray for your endurance to endure, to uh, not faint, not falter, not get weary in well-doing, to keep fighting the good fight, no matter what comes your way. One last hymn, and then we're done. I'm sorry this was supposed to be short, but one last hymn, and then we're done, brothers of Christ. And this is the hymn that God put on my heart, is Day by Day. This is to encourage this brother and sister of Christ. It's to encourage all you, brothers and sisters of Christ, that we're supposed to live day by day. Keep staying in the Word every day. Keep staying in prayer. Keep making sure you're going over your life, that your walk with the Lord is right, and that you're living right according to God's Word. And, you're, and like I said, you love the lost world by preaching the truth to them, being a living witness, a verbal witness, leaving gospel tracts when you can. Okay. Um, just keep fighting the good fight. And remember, it's a day-to-day -day thing. If you look too far out into the future, we're supposed to look for that blessed hope. That's why we're supposed to look for it. And like I said, if Jesus came back tomorrow, what do you need to get done for him today? If Jesus came back today, are you ready? Day by day. We're supposed to live day by day. God will take care of the future. God will take care of what's going on in the world. I trust the Lord. He knows what He's doing. Brothers and sisters, don't get distracted by the world and what's going on in the world. Keep fighting the good fight. Day by day and with each passing moment Strength I find to meet my trials here Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I have no cause for worry or for fear. He whose heart is kind beyond all measure, Gives unto each day what he deems best, Loving its part of pain and pleasure. Mingling toil with peace and rest. Every day the Lord himself is near me. With a special mercy for each hour. All my cares he gladly bears and cheers me. He whose name is Counselor and Power. The protection of his child and treasure Is a charge that on himself he laid As your days your strength shall be in measure This the pledge to me he made Help me then in every tribulation So to trust Thy promises, O Lord, that I lose not face sweet consolation offered me within thy holy word. Help me, Lord, when toil and trouble meeting, ere to take us from our Father's hand. One by one, the days, the moments fleeting, Till I reach the promised land. That blessed hope, brothers of Christ. That blessed hope. One by one. The days, the moments fleeting. We're going home to be with our Savior someday, brothers and sisters Christ. And what we've had to go through down here will seem like nothing compared to eternity. Get your heart right with the Lord. Pray for your brothers and sisters in Christ, especially those around the world that are going through some hard times. Be there for them, not just in prayer, but if it's possible, help your brothers and sisters in Christ out. Physically, exhorting them through the scriptures. Be there for one another, brothers in Christ. Be there one for another. So I want to end this with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Keep fighting the good fight. Keep living for the Lord. Keep staying in this book, Brothers of Christ, hiding it in your heart. And I'll see you in the next video.